Uh, welcome. This is Risa Hoffman, uh, faculty member in the Division of Infectious Diseases and UCLA Program in Global Health, uh, and you are listening to uh, Health and Safety for preclinical students who are doing uh, elective experiences internationally. This is a required uh, part of the curriculum, which must be completed before travel. Uh, if you're a clinical student or trainee looking for uh, the preclinical health and safety talk, uh, please go back to the curriculum website to find the correct talk, which should be labeled uh, health and safety for clinical trainees. So the outline for this talk, um, we're going to cover four topics, including food and water safety, additional uh, health and safety pearls, which is going to include information about insect bites uh, and uh, medications and travel preparation, um, briefly touch on HIV exposures and post-exposure prophylaxis, and end with some information about travel insurance that will be critical for you to know about uh, prior to your departure. So the first topic is food and water safety while living and working abroad. And this is a plate of food from Malawi um, with some fish and pumpkin leaf and a corn-based uh, staple called sema. And one of the most exciting things about uh, working abroad is the cultural experience, and part of this is clearly experiencing the food. Uh, but I'm going to try and give you some information that will help you hopefully uh, avoid getting sick while still being able to enjoy uh, the uh, experience of uh, culture and food abroad. So starting with a question, what is traveler's diarrhea? Uh, a is most commonly caused by parasites. B, most commonly caused by viruses such as rotavirus. C, most commonly caused by bacteria such as E. coli. D, most commonly caused by differences in the composition of water and food in settings outside of the United States. So take a second to think about that. The answer is C, most commonly caused by bacteria such as E. coli, so hopefully you got that right. Um, so with traveler's diarrhea, about 40 to 60 percent of travelers have um, an episode of diarrhea, so this happens to most people at some point. It's nearly always benign and self-limited, although it's obviously very concerning to the person that's having this experience. And more than 90% is caused by bacteria, with the most common being enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC for short. This table shows a long list of possible causes of diarrhea, including bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Um, and the risk of these different things really depends on where you're traveling and what sorts of activities you're doing while traveling. Um, but regardless, really, the most common is going to be bacteria. And within that, the most common will be the enterotoxigenic E. coli. So what is the clinical presentation of traveler's diarrhea? Most commonly, it occurs 4 to 14 days after arrival at the destination. It's self-limited with symptoms lasting 1 to 5 days. Um, about 20% of these episodes can be severe enough to require 1 to 2 days of bed rest. Uh, and with uh, the most common cause, the ETEC or E. coli, um, there's typically a prodrome with malaise, anorexia, and some abdominal cramping, followed by the sudden onset of watery diarrhea, can be accompanied by nausea and vomiting and low-grade fever. So what does one do if experiencing traveler's diarrhea? There's essentially a three-pronged approach, and I'm going to talk about each of these fluids or oral rehydration therapy, anti-motility agents, which should be used with caution, and antibiotics. So uh, the the basic management or the uh, the most important first step is staying hydrated and the best way to stay hydrated is to use a pre-prepared oral rehydration uh, uh, formula. Um, you can make these yourself um, putting together a combination of ingredients and all of these will utilize the sodium glucose co-transport phenomenon um, but they they are difficult to make in the right proportions and when you're sick you may not feel like going out and searching for different ingredients in a country that's unfamiliar to you. So I recommend that uh, people go to a local uh, camping store like REI or Adventure 16 um, where these packets are actually sold and you just need a bottle of water which is um, hopefully going to be uh, clean water and mix these solutions in and you're all set. 
So no matter how mild an episode of traveler's diarrhea is, uh, staying hydrated is the most important uh, component of treatment and using these types of oral rehydration therapies is the best way to do that. The second prong of the approach is anti-motility agents and these definitely need to be used with with caution. The two most common um, are uh, loperamide or imodium, uh, known as imodium or diphenoxalate, which is lamotil, and these reduce stools, but they don't treat the cause of diarrhea. Um, these should not be used with bloody diarrhea because certain causes of bloody diarrhea um, can actually become worse when you stop the GI motility. So in any episode where blood is involved with the stools, um, this would be an agent that you would not want to use. Um, and again, because of these potential risks with certain um, more invasive uh, pathogens, most of the time this is safest to use in conjunction with antibiotics unless the episode of diarrhea is very mild. Uh, so, so for um, moderate to severe diarrhea, we do recommend uh, antibiotics such as Cipro, 500 milligrams twice daily. Um, and how do we define that? Well, I think as the person who's being affected by this problem, you'll have to use your own judgment, but a definition to guide you is four unformed stools daily. These stools may have uh, blood, pus, or mucus, and um, there may be associated fever. Um, there's more and more data showing that um, a single day of antibiotics may be adequate. Um, we used to say always three days, um, but the majority of people actually improve in 24 hours. So um, my recommendation is to take one to three days um, and just stop when you feel better. Um, one of the uh, potential things you may encounter is that you're going to be working abroad and you're going to be traveling and these episodes of traveler's diarrhea can be severe enough, as I said, to cause you to not be able to do what you need and want to do. So um, I think it is reasonable to consider having a lower threshold to take, uh, to take antibiotics if the diarrhea is interfering with uh, the activities that you need to do. Um, the other important note is that um, Azithromycin is also an acceptable treatment for traveler's diarrhea, and what you're given depends on your travel medicine physician. Um, if you are going to Asia, though, you should be given azithromycin rather than ciprofloxacin because of high rates of campylobacter uh, resistance to ciprofloxacin in Asia. So <clears throat> in summary, uh, you want to uh, consider using an anti-motility agent for mild episodes and have a low threshold to add an antibiotic for one to three days. So how do we prevent traveler's diarrhea as people spending time working and living abroad? Um, many of you will know this, but it's always good to review. You want to avoid tap water. Um, make sure when you buy bottled water that the seal is not broken because in some places uh, people will refill bottled water and sell it uh, to make money and the water inside is not actually uh, clean water. Uh, you need to be very careful of ice because usually ice is made from uh, unfiltered or you know regular uh, tap water. Uh, alcohol does not sterilize water or ice, so mixed drinks uh, may still be contaminated. Uh, if bottled water is unavailable, uh, you can boil water or use water filters. And I think I include this here, although most people are not going to places without access to bottled water. But if you are going to a very rural site, um, you can consider uh, buying a, a water filter at one of the camping stores like REI or Adventure 16. Other important uh, ways to avoid diarrhea and illness would be including uh, would include avoiding raw meat. Um, again, this is going to depend on the place that you're traveling, um, but you need to be very careful to um, understand the, the places, the restaurants, and know uh, what the risks are. And you can often ask local people um, to give advice, although it's good to uh, you know make sure you've done your homework and know the risks as well. Uh, avoiding, again, uh, uh, smoked or pickled meats because parasites are often not killed by these procedures. Um, additionally, raw vegetables and fruits may be contaminated. It is safe to eat anything that can be peeled. And you have to be careful of salads because you um, need to know whether the lettuce and vegetables have been adequately cleaned. Uh, this is lower risk, but certain kinds of fish may contain toxins that are not killed by cooking, so I provide the list there. And again, um, this depends on where you're traveling. 
um, and uh, you'll have to do some homework and, and ask uh, locals about their knowledge of these things. Um, and the list is here just for your information. The other higher risk issue is uh, food vendor street food. Um, these do have high rates of contamination and can be very tempting. Um, so just I mention this because this is one of the more common ways that I think um, people traveling abroad end up with traveler's diarrhea. And one last pearl on this is that food items on the aircraft are often obtained at the city of departure. So for example, if you're traveling on South African Airways from Malawi to South Africa, your food on board is coming from Malawi. So the same precautions that you would use in Malawi should be applied to the food on that flight. So when do you seek help? I think the truth of the, the matter here is that you seek help whenever you have a question um, and have a very low threshold to seek help. But you should definitely seek help if you're having symptoms that persist beyond 10 to 14 days or if you're having high fevers, uh, abdominal pain that's you know moderate to severe, bloody diarrhea, or severe vomiting. Uh, we tend to defer stool cultures um, and uh, ova and parasite examination for cases that last beyond two weeks, but these are things that can be considered for those types of persistent infections. So we're moving on now to the second uh, travel bullet, which is a combination of different health issues that you need to think about while traveling abroad. And the first is what you need to think about for prescription and over-the-counter medications for yourself as you're getting ready to travel. So when I get ready to travel, I open up my medicine cabinet and I look at what's inside and I think about what I use on a fairly regular basis and I pull it out and I pack it. Um, and I highly recommend this technique for those of you who are traveling abroad so that you can think about uh, what you need to bring with you. Um, my uh, advice is that people bring their own medications when they travel, whether they're considered over-the-counter or prescription. You have to be very careful buying medications in other countries. You can buy certain medications in other countries that, that we require a prescription for here can be purchased through a chemist over the counter, um, but the strengths of these preparations, the names, um, the strengths can be different, the names can be different, um, and you don't always know um, how, you know, what the quality is. So this is always an option, but I think the better option is to have your own with you and for contact lenses to bring your own uh, solutions that you need for cleaning. The other thing to consider depending on your destination is bringing a small first aid kit um, that again these can be purchased from REI or Adventure 16. Um, it also helps you to not have to remember a long list of things that you need to bring with you because they come with different pain medications, band-aids, alcohol, tape, and um, it's just a nice way to have a whole uh, host of things that could be needed. Um, depending on where you're traveling, you can consider bringing sterile needles. Um, these can al also be purchased um, in places that sell these first aid kits. Um, and if you're bringing them with you, you should put them in your checked bags and not carry on because they would be taken away at security. The next item is swimming and water safety. Um, it's important to note that in many areas of the world, it is not safe to swim in fresh water. Um, and this is one area where you might get some different advice from locals than you do from uh, the literature or uh, pre-travel physicians in the United States um, because there is often uh, a degree of, of, of an unknown of how safe certain parts of a lake are, for example. So as a rule, the more stagnant the water, the more likely it is to be unsafe for you. Pool water that is adequately chlorinated is safe. Uh, salt water does not usually have uh, parasites and is not usually a risk unless it is contaminated with sewage and this is something that you can generally assess by just looking at the local environment. This is a picture of uh, Lake Malawi um, and it's an absolutely beautiful place. Um, one of the problems with Lake Malawi is that it is um, one of the uh, lakes that has a parasite called schistosomiasis which uh, can cause uh, uh, serious problems in some cases um, depending on the type with either the urinary system or the liver. 
So uh, one of the challenges is that certain parts of Lake Malawi are high risk for schisto and other parts are not. And it's very difficult by, to know by looking. And so I think I just encourage you to read about the places that you're traveling to, to get advice from your pre-travel uh, physicians and to get advice from locals and then use your judgment about what is um, ultimately safe. This is a map of the global distribution of schistosomiasis. You can see that most of the uh, scope of the issue is in Africa, but that there is uh, ongoing uh, you know, activity in South America and Asia. Um, next topic is animal and insect bites. Um, in terms of animal bites, this is something that we, you know, don't think about very commonly in the United States, but uh, rabies is a huge problem in developing countries and it's most commonly transmitted by dog bites. And in many of the places in resource poor settings, there are many, many street dogs and village dogs and pack dogs. Um, and these are uh, dogs that, you know, don't necessarily look rabid by um, the typical features that you think of, um, but uh, can uh, you know, can carry rabies and be sick without looking that way. So um, for those of you who are animal lovers, um, I would encourage you to not attempt to feed monkeys or to pet animals that aren't domesticated. Stay away from street dogs because again, no matter how cute um, an animal may be, you just can't tell by looking whether a dog is rabid or not rabid. So what do you do if an animal bite occurs? Um, if any bite occurs, you want to wash the wound with soap and water for 10 to 15 minutes and then seek medical attention. Um, you may need to receive rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Post-exposure rabies immunization is required regardless of a history of vaccination. So if there are cases where uh, people have pre-exposure rabies, that does not uh, mean that you don't need the post-exposure series. Um, it just means you may have a little more time to be able to get to the post-exposure rabies uh, vaccination. So, um, you know, it's important to seek care if you have an animal bite. Um, do not attempt to catch the animal because unlike in this country where we catch the animal and we observe it and um, we have programs that help with this, um, in developing countries these programs don't exist. And so trying to catch an animal leads to more people being bitten um, and there's no real program for then, you know, observing or testing the animal. Uh, insects and, and tick bites uh, are, again, a, a risk to most everyone, no matter where you're traveling. And the risk, people focus so much on malaria, but there's actually a long list of uh, infectious diseases that are transmitted, including dengue, yellow fever, filariasis, tick bite fever. Um, and these aren't just dusk to dawn risks. These are, um, many of them, transmitted by day biting mosquitoes. Um, so you need to think about this during the day and you need to think about this at night. Uh, for places with high rates of, you know, with uh, malaria, uh, use bed nets if they're recommended. They should be tucked in and they should have no holes. Um, all these countries where malaria is common, they will be able to, uh, sorry, they, they sell bed nets. So if you get to your destination and your net has lots of holes, ask around. Uh, usually you can very cheaply buy a replacement bed net to use. And of course, uh, you should be given malaria prophylaxis if traveling to a malaria endemic country. Um, and please take this as prescribed as this is a very effective therapy uh, to prevent malaria. So preventing insect bites is the best way to prevent getting sick. Uh, and so I'm gonna provide a few recommendations for that. Uh, apply repellent sparingly only to expose skin or clothing, not under clothing. Uh, deep concentrations between 30 and 35% are effective. And when using higher concentrations, generally what happens is uh, you don't get more efficacy, but you get more irritation. Uh, and most kinds of DEET don't come with sunscreen combined or included. So don't forget that if you're using DEET and you're out in the sun, you may need to also apply sunscreen. Uh, a lot of places sell non-DEET repellents. They contain citronella or natural ingredients, and these actually just don't work as well as DEET. They're short-term and not as effective. So I, you know, you can um, buy them, you can bring them, but I would encourage you to use DEET as well in situations and environments that are higher risk. 
Uh, permethrin can be sprayed on clothing or bed nets or you can you know, soak things in permethrin and it will last for six weeks even with laundering. Uh, this may be appropriate if you're spending time in a rural area where you're going to be highly exposed. Um, and uh, you can also go to some of these local stores I've mentioned like REI and buy uh, impregnated t-shirts and long sleeve shirts um, that work quite well. Uh, you can use flying insect spray inside and typically these are available in places. Uh, you don't have to bring them with you. Um, the effective ones should contain a pyrethroid insecticide. Uh, in terms of your clothing, looser clothing uh, with high necklines, long sleeves, and long pants, although many of these environments are quite warm and this may be deemed uncomfortable, uh, you know, depending on where you are and what you're doing, this is a really important uh, intervention that you can do to decrease your risk of getting sick. Uh, sheer fabrics, bright colors, shiny jewelry, perfumes, scented soaps or shampoos, aftershave lotions, open sandals, all of these things are inviting insects uh, to come and bite you. So I would uh, uh, just take note of this and avoid uh, those types of things when you're in a higher risk environment. In case of febrile illness, seek medical attention. I think you're, if you're doing medical work or research or uh, public health work abroad, you'll hopefully be in an environment where you'll have uh, good local support. Um, and again, UCLA faculty are available to you and should be contacted with any questions. If for whatever reason you're unable to be evaluated, uh, one of the ways you can manage is by self-treating for malaria. Um, if you're given malarone by your doctor, you can use that four tablets daily for three days. Um, you can also buy local malaria treatment, which is highly effective and well tolerated. Um, most of them are um, called co-artem or uh, or artemisin based and uh, they're usually quite cheap and very readily available. This is a picture of the uh, formulation that's available in Malawi. It's meant for patients so it's you know uh, pictures of how to take it um, and you can buy this type of a thing in most countries where malaria is endemic and uh, if you're traveling on safari or traveling as part of your uh, work experience having one of these packets available is a good idea. For additional health and safety information, I recommend that you go to the Centers for Disease Control site, um, as well as the State Department site, which lists uh, specific information by country. And again, for supplies, I've mentioned a couple of places, REI and Adventure 16, uh, that are really great for ideas and for supplies for traveling. So I'm going to touch briefly on HIV exposures and my note here is that those of you listening to this lecture should not really be at risk for an occupational exposure because you are preclinical students who are going on uh, a research or public health type experience. So we hope that you aren't actually doing um, procedures. But I think this is an important topic that um, you should know about as you're heading off for your experience. So a question to start, true or false. Uh, dengue can be transmitted by needle stick splash exposures, and I'll give you a second to think about it. The answer is true. Uh, here is a long list of infectious diseases that can be transmitted by stick or splash exposures. So uh, the importance of, of universal precautions and of not engaging in activities for which you aren't trained um, or supervised to do is extremely important. Um, so what if something were to happen and you were to experience an exposure while working abroad? Um, we do have a very effective intervention for the prevention of HIV transmission um, and that's called PEP or post-exposure prophylaxis and there's uh, enough human data to show that this is a very effective intervention. Um, this is a case control study that was done in 1997, a long time ago, uh, with 710 healthcare workers who had an HIV exposure. 31 of these acquired HIV and 679 did not. Um, and ultimately the study shows showed that uh, the odds of HIV infection were reduced by 81% in healthcare workers with an exposure who received two drugs uh, for post-exposure prophylaxis. So for they received two antiretrovirals after an HIV exposure, their risk of acquiring HIV was reduced by 81%. 
So this is an incredibly effective intervention, um, and despite the fact that this is a problematic type of study with retrospective data and no protocol and very small numbers, um, this is still really the best data that we have because this is effective. Um, no placebo-controlled trial of this will ever be done, um, but I just wanted to review to show you that um, PEP is a highly effective intervention for an exposure. Um, how long do you take PET4 after an exposure? Um, this data comes mostly from the macaque model of HIV called SIV, um, and monkeys given a single antiretroviral called tenofovir after uh, 24 hours after inoculation with the virus had PEP administered for 3, 10, or 28 days. And you can see here that those monkeys that got 28 days had no conver uh, zero conversion, so no HIV infections. So 28 days of PEP looks pretty effective, and that was uh, reinforced by this other macaque model. Um, similarly used this drug called tenofovir, um, and they had a control group and a group that was treated for 28 days, and there were no uh, infections in the treated group, and all of the controls became infected. So PEP works for uh, exposures. Uh, it should be taken immediately upon an exposure and continued for 28 days. And again, uh, for those of you listening to this lecture, um, I mention it uh, just so you are armed with this knowledge, but um, you should be thinking about uh, what, what if any, types of exposures you, you would have and making sure that uh, your faculty mentor um, is uh, aware of any sorts of uh, procedures or, or medical care that you're providing as part of your work. Um, so. Another way you're at risk for uh, HIV exposures is through uh, the non-occupational route, and this means through uh, sexual exposures or intravenous drug use. Um, and we have no controlled data on the efficacy of NPEP, or non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. And the reason this might be different than occupational exposures is because the immuno immunologic environment in the genital tract is different, um, with different viral load patterns, or resistance patterns, and inflammation patterns, that with sexual and IV drug use exposures, repeated exposures are more common. Um, and that in the case of sexual assault, source testing is usually not possible. So uh, again, based on, on the data from the occupational experience um, and based on some small studies going on, including here in LA County, um, in men who have sex with men, non-occupational PEP is uh, safe and feasible and something that uh, we would recommend for uh, an exposure. This just shows you that uh, the, the range of exposures over uh, different types of, uh, of uh, sources, so blood transfusion obviously uh, very high risk, but you'll note that certain kinds of sexual intercourse are higher risk than percutaneous needle stick, and that you know uh, these sexual exposures are not, sm risk from sexual exposure is not small. Um, so important to always uh, keep that in mind as you're out in the world. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. So when should PEP be started? Um, basically, the risks of PEP stay constant over time. The benefits go down the further out you get from the time of exposure. So the answer is that PEP should be started immediately after an exposure, whether it's a sexual exposure um, or from an occupational uh, needle stick or, or splash. Um, and again, this is why PEP should be started right away, is because a small founder population, maybe a single virus establishes infection within hours of exposure um, with expansion and dissemination occurring days to weeks later. So this is the window of opportunity in which to intervene. So again, those of you listening to this lecture are most at risk possibly of a non-occupational exposure, and we want you to know that we would want to know as your faculty members about this and be able to discuss next steps, including what type of exposure occurred, whether PEP is necessary, um, what sort of testing is needed for you, and uh, testing the, the other uh, person involved if possible, um, and providing emotional support because these are very, very stressful experiences and um, we want to be able to support you through them. So 
for any sort of occupational or non-occupational exposure, uh, we want uh, to hear from you. And uh, this would include whoever your primary faculty mentor is um, uh, or uh, your local uh, mentor support at the site. Um, and again, just uh, you know, a reminder to be safe at work. Um, you know, this lecture was originally prepared for our students traveling through our global health education program, um, doing research and public health experiences, and our view is that uh, students that haven't been trained in clinical work shouldn't be engaging in medical procedures. And it's important to note that when you go to places uh, outside of the United States where there are few resources and shortages of clinicians, uh, you may be placed in a situation where you're asked to help out <coughs> And I think it's important for you to be able to, uh, to communicate that you're not comfortable and that you haven't been trained um, and be certain that people around know what you're doing and, and what the expectations are. And then to be safe outside of the hospital and clinic, don't go out alone at night. If going out, you know, go out with a friend, go out in groups, take taxis, arrange drivers. This is going to vary by setting, but even here in, in Los Angeles, we want to use these kinds of precautions. We also want to remind you to be extremely cautious with dating and sexual experiences abroad because HIV and the prevalence of STI or sexually transmitted infections is extremely high in many of these settings. Um, and so again, this, these are not low risk uh, types of uh, things to engage in. So the final uh, topic we're going to touch on is uh, travel insurance, and uh, this is uh, critical for any UCLA person going overseas to, uh, to work or have an experience. So you'll see in front of you a website. Um, you want to start by going to this website, um, which is where you're going to register your trip. And you want to do this prior to travel, and you want to do this um, when your itinerary is pretty well defined because you're going to enter in exactly uh, where you're going to be and when. So you go to the site and you create a profile, and um, basically a, a file is, is created for you. Um, so you're covered as a student um, or a trainee. Um, and the covered benefits include uh, emergency medical evacuation, uh, out-of-country medical expenses. So if you're overseas and you become sick, um, you have a $50 deductible and all of your expenses will be paid if you uh, have a, a you know, broken arm and you need to go to the hospital or something else happens. Um, security extraction, so if there's any sort of political unrest or reason you would need to be expatriated, the coverage includes uh, bringing you out of the country and home. Um, and then other helpful travel assistance services like finding a hospital, helping if you lost your passport, um, helping if you've lo had something lost or stolen, and then customized travel intelligence, which just as soon as you register, uh, the system will update you on any occurrences in the areas where you're traveling, the train strike or uh, uh, political protests or things that are helpful to know about. So when you get to the site, you'll see this field, you'll enter your information, your UC ID, um, most of you are going to be uh, graduate students uh, in training and on the Los Angeles campus. Um, you will then enter your uh, destinations and your travel start and end dates. Um, and this is very important because this is how the system is going to let you know uh, what's going on where and provide you the services that you might need. Um, at the end of this, there'll be a submit button and you'll get um, the chance to print out your insurance card. Um, most of you are going to be students, and so you'll click on the student link, um, and you'll get an email that is your insurance card. Um, you want to take note of the phone numbers and the policy numbers. I've usually programmed these into my phone, um, along with um, in the notes what the policy and plan number are. And um, you can keep this on your email, so you have it there. You can print it and put it in your wallet. Um, you can give it to a parent or a friend. And I recommend you know you have several ways to access this information in case you need it. Um, so the bottom line is, when in doubt, uh, call for help. Um, as you're getting ready for your travels, um, you should be keeping a list of who your emergency contacts are going to be at UCLA faculty, um, family, friends here, as well as who your local contacts are going to be um, at the site where you're working. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to uh, 
contact me if you have any specific questions or concerns. My email is rhoffman, uh, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, at mednet.ucla.edu. Again, rhoffman at mednet.ucla.edu. So that concludes this portion of the health and safety lecture. Um, you should uh, go back to the curriculum site and make sure that you've completed all the necessary components of the pre-travel curriculum uh, so that you're ready to go. Um, so please uh, travel safely and have fun.